You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. Cautioning against the preconceived meaning of words, Father Paul explains that our understanding of a term's meaning must conform to that term's usage in the text in context. I am happy to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. Good and evil, the positive and the negative, as I mentioned earlier, it's a dilemma that will be solved when we shall discuss the issue of good versus evil in Scripture. So I have this in mind. But for now, let us proceed with the words in their order of appearance in the text. Because this good and evil will come around in chapter 2. Remember, in chapter 1, you have only tob, good. But the good and evil, you see the technicality I'm following doesn't appear until chapter 2, so we have to wait until chapter 2. Okay? We encounter the term good, and in this case it's only good, because God himself sees it as good. So the good in chapter 1 is good. But it doesn't mean that good is good. Remember the prophets. You see, things in your eyes are good, but not in my eyes. Having discussed Reshit earlier, let's move to Bara. We heard it earlier, but I'm going to concentrate. Mind you again, in the Bible, this Bara, in this verbal form, is used only with God as subject. Only God, or the Lord, Bara, okay, in Hebrew. But I'm going to discuss this matter, as I do in my book, and earlier in my podcast, in conjunction with Tohu Wabuhu, and I shall show you in which sense they are connected. I combine these two matters, since both items are found one verse apart and in a clear relationship. Okay, in the beginning God bara the heavens and the earth, yet the earth was, tohu and bo. Okay, so they are linked through the noun earth. What makes them special is that the first is used profusely, nine times, up to six, seven, the first meaning the verb bara. And then disappears until number 1630, where, interestingly, Bara introduces a negative action on God's part. Okay, let's read it since we have time. But if the Lord creates, which is obviously Bara, something new, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into Sheol, then you shall know that this man has despised the Lord. Okay, I rest my case. So Bara, in Genesis 1, is imposed to you as good because the text tells you that God saw that it was good. But bara in itself is not a sign only of good, positive. And this is where theology gets stuck with create. And I'm going to quote you in a few minutes that famous text of Isaiah 45, 7 where we hear that God creates darkness. Which is not the case in Genesis 1. Darkness is already there, he creates light. So here again, we have to be extremely careful and not only listen to scripture, but submit to it. 
As for the couple Tohu Wabuhu, they are found only twice more. Once in Isaiah 34:11, in parallel but separated, and in Jeremiah 4:23, where they are combined, Tohu Wabuhu, just as in Genesis 1:2. The use of Bohu is restricted to these three instances. Isaiah 34, 11, Jeremiah 4, 23, and Genesis 1, 2. On the other hand, Tohu occurs many more times, the first of which not until Deuteronomy 32, 10. A window to solving this conundrum is offered us in Isaiah chapters 40 through 66 where we encounter the highest incidence in scripture of both the verb bara 19 times plus 1 in Isaiah 4 5 compared to 28 in the rest of scripture out of which 11 occur in Genesis 1 through 6 and the noun tohu. So we have bara, very high incidence in Isaiah, and the noun tohu, which is found eight times in Isaiah 40 through 66, plus three times in Isaiah 1 through 39, compared to only eight in the rest of Scripture outside Genesis 1 2. So we have bara and tohu that appear with very high incidence in chapters 40 to 59 of Isaiah. It is then not only understandable, but also advisable to look for help in both these matters of Bara and Tohu in Isaiah 40 through 66. You don't begin with the meaning of the word. It is just with the incidences. I'm going to ask the patience of my hearers because I'm going to read lengthily the texts, beginning with the first where we have Tohu and Bohu in Isaiah and Jeremiah. So bear with me. I need the full text so that the hearer would figure out the mood in the use of these two Hebrew words. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a day of recompense for the cause of Zion. And the streams of Adam shall be turned into pitch, and their soil into brimstone. Her land shall become burning pitch. Night and day it shall not be quenched, its smoke shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste, none shall pass through it forever and ever. But the hawk of the porcupine shall possess it, the owl and the raven shall dwell in it. He shall stretch the line of Tohu over it and the plummet of Bohu over its nobles. They shall name it no kingdom there, and all its princes shall be nothing. Thorns shall grow over its strongholds, nettles and thistles in its fortresses. It shall be the haunt of jackals and abode for ostriches, and wild beasts shall meet with hyenas, the satyr shall cry to his fellow, Yea, there shall the night hag alight and find for herself a resting place. There shall the owl nest and lay and hatch and gather her young in her shadow. Yea, there shall the kites be gathered, each one with her mate. Notice in this case that even the animals can work in different directions. Like the dove, I remember earlier we touched on that, can be positive in the case of the flood but fluttering around in the prophets, it's not a good sign. So there is nothing preconceived in the matter. So that's why besides vocabulary, I keep adding the word phraseology. That was in Isaiah 34. In Jeremiah 4, where we have it in 23, but I'm going to read verses 20 through 29. Disasters follows hard on disaster, the whole land is laid waste. Suddenly my tents are destroyed, my curtains in a moment. 
how long must I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? Let me jump to 23, because I said enough in Isaiah. I looked on the earth, and lo, it was tohu wabuhu. Very interesting. And to the heavens, and they had no light. Notice you have an extension on Genesis 1, Okoto, and then remember that light is connected to the darkness which is in Genesis 1. But notice how Toho and Bohu is negative. I looked on the mountains and lo, they were quaking and the hills moved to and fro. Okay. The conclusion is unmistakable. Tohu or Bohu describes a desolation, a ruin, and more precisely, its outcome, the rubble. Okay, review these two texts and you will see it with your eyes. In other words, it is the same elements, that is stones, yet they are not functional. That's the difference between building and rubble. It's not that essentially they are different. Conceptually they are different, but not essentially. Dilapidated stones do not equal a house or a city. Thus was the earth and not the heavens in verse 2. So if the author split between the couple, the heavens and the earth, it's his intention. Okay? Notice how in Jeremiah the author cunningly divides between the two. I looked on the earth and lo, it was tohu abuhu and to the heavens and they had no light. Later we shall see that the main function of the heavens through its luminaries is to shed light. You see how slowly on, the more you know scripture, the more you know scripture. Consequently, the verb bara cannot logically mean create the way it has come to be understood in philosophy or theology out of nothing ex nihilo. For how can one possibly speak of nothing, let alone posit nothing? That is why the ancient Greeks, before philosophy, spoke of a chaos out of which the gods made a cosmos, cosmeticized it, made it functional. Whence our term cosmetics that is used to render someone presentable in view of a function. I introduce the Greeks as an aside because, as you all know, my intention is to use the Septuagint. The Septuagint got it right, at least in Greek, when it introduced the term cosmos in Genesis 2.1 to render their hosts, the heavens and all their hosts. Very interestingly. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, Tzaba'am. But the Greeks said, Ke sine telesti san o uranos ke igi en pas o cosmos afton. Again, the Greek is not a reference for me, but it helps me to how things work for Greek and to help me understand better from another angle, the original. Cosmos does not occur again. You see, you hear for the first time cosmos here. You don't go to a Greek dictionary to understand it. That's no reference for me. You wait, and in this case you have to wait until Exodus chapter 33. That's painful. I know I cheat because I have Bible works. But technically, you're not allowed to cheat. You have to wait. And there, it refers to the ornaments, cosmetic, of Israel, for which Israel was criticized. Here we go again with the positive negative. Because cosmos, cosmetics, immediately you think positive. Again, the same action is positive when originating with God. 
and negative when the human being is its author. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.